and I'm there. Yeah. And then I, then I have this situation happen where, you know, I ask mummy the question, you know, the question, a series of questions often of, mummy, if God's always good, then why do people die? And you know what happened when many of you asked that question, if you ever were brave enough to ask your parent who's going to church that question? You get a little tap across the face sometimes, or how dare you say God's bad? And you know, like you, you get the anger based response to shut you down rather than uh, it, it being an honest question that you need to ask. And so, what, what, ha what happens when there are questions about God is we're taught not to ask them. Can you see that? Like you think how much in your own life you've been taught not to ask the questions that need to be asked or about God. Or absorb the feeling from your parents that you'll never resolve that. Don't just, just forget about it. You, you can't know. And many parents get upset because they personally have not resolved the question. And they're just as confused and angry about the resol resolution of that question uh, as you often are, or even more so. And so when you ask the question, they just respond in, in rage. Like, how dare you even ask that question? Or, you know, they, they go down this track of trying to deny the process of even answering the question. Because they, many parents don't want to do this. They don't, don't want to say, look, darling, I've got no idea. But it's a wonderful question. And perhaps we should investigate it more thoroughly, huh? Because, because we all feel, many of us, feel that it, these questions are unresolvable. And since they're unresolvable, what's the point of asking them? And so what we do is we close down this whole field of investigation about God. It all gets shut down. We investigate science, we investigate, you know, cultures, religious formats on earth, and we investigate religion, but we don't actually investigate God. Even when we investigate religion, we're not really investigating God because we're investigating the religion's interpretation of what God is. Right? So, so we're still shut down quite a lot from investigating God. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, once you ask the question and you get an answer back, the first answer back feels really liberating. Um, and it um, makes it really exciting yeah. to ask more questions. I agree. And to get more answers back. So the more you ask and if you have that real longing, yeah. it's just... Like it's it, wonderful. Yeah, and it makes it easier to ask more questions. Yeah, so. it was Adele, wasn't it? Yes. Yep. Now, Adele, I put to you though, the answers that come back could also be coming from an alternative source. Yes, they could. So now we have got this additional question: <laughs> Was that wonderful answer I just got from God, or was it just from a person in another dimension that I can't see, that I think is God? And you have to trust by asking more questions. Exactly. exactly. You've got to that keep is, asking questions. That is the, the beautiful thing. Everyone just goes, oh, my gosh, there's too many questions. Some of you are like, no way, I can't do this. There's so many questions. But that's because there's no wonder in this process. You know, if we just go into it going, OK, whoo, I think I made a discovery. I think something that's here could be going over here, but I just have to keep asking questions then we can stay invigorated by this process. Yep. If we get really fearful and go, no, I have to know now, and I can't, I can't keep asking all these questions, it's taxing, uh, you know, then we're gonna get really tired. And that's where our desire for, you know, desire for the process can lead us. And I guess the more you develop in the process, the more trust you have in it. So every single truth that I've ever resolved personally about God and the universe and all of those other things have been resolved through this process for me. So, and, and please bear in mind that this side here, the shore side, I need to say a bit about it. It's not just what you feel and know is the truth, actually. Because there is this other aspect to the truth actually entering you and that is that it has to be actually an experience. So in other words, I can postulate to you that we can walk through that brick wall there. Theoretically, that brick wall is made of atoms, my body is made of atoms. Is that not true? Well, that's another theory that I'm presenting to you. <laughs> 
And if that's the case, if we are made of the same of matter, then it would make sense that I could somehow align my matter if I had control over my matter, and, and somehow uh, align that matter if I had control over that matter, and and I could physically walk through that brick wall. And you might even be able to explain all the science of that to us. Tell us exactly how that would happen, and you've discovered this new truth, and it's all going to work like this. And so you could stand up here for three hours and tell us how you could walk through the wall, and right. for sure. And then when, the, when I walk through that wall, now all of that fact, although, although being presented to you as fact, now becomes proven, does it not? By the experience. Do you follow me? And it's only by the experience that what we feel and know as truth really becomes truth. So there are many people on the planet and in the spirit world who think they know the truth, they think they feel the truth as a certain way and yet they have not had the experience and so therefore they cannot still say for certain. So it's like they're, so they're up there going, yes, I know the science, this is for sure. I know that this is, this, you are atoms, the wall is atoms. It's possible to do it. I can explain it to you. I can tick all the boxes. It is a sure thing. But they've never actually done it. So they haven't had the experience. And that's the difference. They can even say, no, no, it's in this pile. But unless mm. they've done it, it's not there. It's not in that pile yet. Until you have personally done it, you will never have anything in that pile. And it's very important that we're honest with ourselves that it's yet to personally happen. So I can talk to you about God till I'm blue in the face. And I can tell you that God will give you her love if you long for her love and talk about how to long for her love and all those kind of things. But until that personally happens for you and you recognise it as the truth in the experience, it will never become a fact. And you can talk about it all you like to another person and it's still not a fact. And it's still never going to be a fact until you've had the personal experience of it happening to you. It's the same with the law of attraction and all the other laws of God. Exactly the same principles apply. Now, instead of judging the other person's experience, because every experience has to be, be a personal experience, instead of judging it, we just need to recognise, OK, I have yet to have that experience. And since I'm yet to have that experience, I can't say for certain whether that thing is true or not true. However, I can also go through a whole set of experiences and understand everything that's happening about certain things, and then I know for certain that thing is true. And I know for certain what is being said is true. And so the way, you know, a lot of the things that I'm presenting to yourself as truth can only be presented because I have personally had the experience of that truth. That's the only reason why I'm very definite about what I'm saying to you as truth. Many times you'll ask me a question and sometimes I'll go, oh, I don't know. A child in a recent uh, uh, presentation put up her hand and said, who created God? And I said, I don't know. Because I've not personally had that experience of knowing that particular truth. So I can't answer that truth. Um, I don't, and I actually said to her, I don't know anybody else who has had that either. But you said it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful question. That's still in the all the things I don't know box. Does that make sense? And there's quite a lot of things in that box still. In fact, what you'll find is that God has created this beautiful universe where a lot of, there's so much in that pile that you'll spend a lot of your life enjoying the discovery of it. The only reason why we don't enjoy discovery is because we were taught not to do enjoy discovery by our parents. And not to enjoy this state of, I don't know. Not to enjoy that state. But not only that, we, we were taught if we didn't know something, that we were stupid, dumb, idiot. You know, there's a lot of emotional attachment to us not knowing things. And then when we got to this phase and when we started to experiment, when you experiment, by definition, you are going to make a mistake. How do parents feel about mistakes? Like, you pick up a glass, you're a little child, pick up a glass, it's mum's precious glass. She's only got six of them. 
They, they were come from her married when she got married, and she's so attached to that because that, you know, that was a special gift by somebody. And all of a sudden it gets fumbled and bang on the ground. And what happens? It was a mistake for many, but what happens? Now you get this barrage of very negative emotions from your mother. Even she might even scream at you and say, Why did you do that? And you know, get all this terrible. And so, little you just going, oh, just test me here. so, little you who's down here <laughs> looking up at this ogre now who's yelling and screaming at you is going, <laughs> You know, what do you do now? What have you just learned about a mistake? Don't yeah. test the theory unless you're sure. You know, you, know, you might have just been testing the theory with, with glass bounce. All <laughs> the theory that I can use my hand like mum does. Yeah. yeah. You know? And yet, uh, as soon as we test a lot of these theories as a child, we automatically get punished and therefore we become so afraid of even making a mistake. So, so I'll put to you that many of you are very afraid of making mistakes, yeah? And, In and your life. He, like for this whole process to work, you have to have a vital ingredient. And it's the ingredient that will actually speed up your discoveries. Yeah. Desire. And, you, you and the fear of making mistake doesn't help desire very much, does it? Like, if you're so afraid you're going to make a mistake in every move you make, how are, you, how are you ever going to follow a desire you have? Right. And uh, lots of people who have come to talks in the past have come and gone, wow, this is fascinating, but, well, what if this is a mistake? What if know? it's wrong? What if it's wrong? And no trust in themselves and the fact that they could go, well, if it's wrong, then I'll just go back to the drawing board, you know? There's so much fear that shuts down this huge explorative uh, process. Yeah, and many people in the future, once, uh, you know, there's a lot of media attention that's being focused our way now, and sooner or later that will go to the mainstream media, and many of you will, you know, get accused of being in a cult and all these other things, which you know you're not in, but anyway. Um, but it's just... Maybe, maybe it's still in there, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's still in your own, I don't know, category. I agree. Or maybe it's in your no idea category. <laughs> but, um, but, but just the fear of the potentiality of making a mistake that can be judged by others, and you'll feel that, and you'll go, whoa, yeah, that's pretty big actually like how manipulative that can be in terms of this process of experimenting so, so most of you um, the beauty the beauty of what we're trying to create myself and Mary is that we're trying to have no strings attached to everything so you start to learn then that you can experiment without without any form of punishment in other words you can you can you can on one hand go, yeah, I can go, I can go along the talk and listen, and then three months later you go, I don't believe that, I don't believe that, and yet AJ still comes up and gives you a hug every time he sees you or something and, and shakes your hand and doesn't treat you badly. But then, um, you know, so you know that even if, even if you totally disagree with everything I'm saying to you, you're still not going to be ostracised or criticised by myself, right? And... and the reason why is I feel God does not ostracise and criticise anybody who's in an experimentative state. And I, she wants you to experiment her universe. But she created. She created. If you look at a child, you to experiment. Which is the most pristine <coughs> form of ourself. What are they doing? They're asking questions. They want to learn. They they want to experiment. They want to. That's their way of doing it. And it's not just an intellectual thing. They're doing it with their whole body all of the time, and their emotions, and they're stepping right into that experience. And whoop, they fell off the chair. And they're like, not afraid even. Like they fall off the chair, bash their head. You know, got a great big lump coming up, and the next moment they got back on the trying to get back on the chair again. Like they, they they don't give up just because they had a little bit of pain in the process, right? Because they, it's only when they were punished for the process that now they have huge amounts of resistance. Now, this is something we need to be aware of, that God, if there is a God, God is not going to punish you for experimenting in a universe that's full of experiments. Right? So God wants you to experiment with different things. And the key is to feel as you experiment. And if you feel as you experiment, you'll find... But even that, at this point, might be a maybe, you know? So the, you can see how almost all of our life is either in the... I don't, I've got no idea, or maybe. 
And it's only when we know and feel the truth and we have the personal experience that it will become a solid fact. Right? Now, many people in your life, throughout all of your life, have told you that there is this fact and there's this fact and there's this fact. You, you grew up, actually, reading history books where facts were presented, so-called facts, that are not actually true. They're just the accepted societal fact, but, but not actually... And then there's a whole series of facts about history, for example, that were never presented. There's all this truth that nobody's ever discovered about, the, like our, the truth of our nation, exa for example. Like how many of us get taught in our school, in our childhood at school, about the genocide of the Aboriginal race in Tasmania, for example? Or the stolen generation. Oh, they might teach that in schools now, but... Uh, how many of us happen when we were young? Yeah. The reason why is because society has certain things they don't want to accept as facts, even when they did happen, because there's a lot of emotions connected. So, so while we keep everything as we possibly can, either in the no idea or this, it's only through the knowing and feeling of the experience that it will become this. Now, what a lot of people do, and these people become what you call philosophizers. They live in this area, never wanting anything to become that area. They love this area. They, they like create a, a um, glowing facade of this is a wonderful place to be. And it is a wonderful place to be in a place of experiment. But to stay there. But at some point, something must become known as a fact for you to actually embrace a happy life and for you to actually embrace knowledge. Right? And so, it, I'm, so I, and, and in fact, if that hadn't happened in your own history, many of you who flew here today for today's meeting would never have been out of fly because of somebody not knowing and feeling and then experiencing the truth of flight, for example. That would never have occurred. Because this whole process isn't one of indecision. It's not like, oh, so many questions, I don't know, I don't know. Oh, ask another question, I don't know. And it's not a process of philosophizing, no. where I'm just coming up with idea after idea and after that's idea. That's a beautiful idea, and think about the aspects of that idea. And I'm only just enjoying the discussion of it. Yeah. But rather we want to, at some point, know for sure whether what we're discussing is true. Don't you? Don't you want some surety at some point? <laughs> about would it be true or not. So I can love this process, but I really want this pile. Like, I, I want it a lot. Mm. And that's the desire that will pull me through it. And also the desire, when you harness this desire, guys, and you go, no, actually, what they're saying, I think I want to try out. I'm just going to start with one. And when you really desire it, watch how quickly you start to get answers or get more information anyway. Things that you have, you might not have thought about God for 20 years in a really sincere way. And then you go, no, I really want some, some more info on this. You step into a whole other interaction and bam, someone you don't even know on the bus is going, have you ever thought about God? Do you know what I... And you're like, wow, OK, I've attracted something else. Or you pick up a book in the doctor's waiting room and go, oh, yeah, that's really... Fe I'm feeling that more. And suddenly you're in this process that was ignited by your desire for truth, but it, it had to be... like You had to have the desire, the true desire. Now, the only difference between myself and someone like the Wright brothers, you know, the Wright brothers who came up with that f first flying machine, sort of, well, it wasn't the first, but it was the first that was documented successfully as working. Um, the only difference between myself and them is that I've focused on the truth about God first, whereas they focused on the truth about flight first. But basically, we used exactly the same principles. Do you see that? And you know, the Wright brothers, they weren't very intellectual about this whole flight thing. Yeah, they used their brains. They were quite logical. But I bet they didn't sit back and go, you know, maybe we should work on that plane thing. You know, like there was a lot of feeling. Desire, passion. Desire, passion, emotionally engaged. When he crashed, they felt it. <laughs> and not only that, whenever they read every book that said flight is not possible, they go, yeah, we might as well give this up. Because they say flight is not possible. Did they do that? No. And so whenever you read a book that says, oh, you should give up this investigation of God, or, you know, oh, God's, not, God's not real, but that's not a reason to give up the investigation at all. It's just following somebody else's opinion.
right? So how does everyone feel about that process? I sort of realise why I've stayed in self-reliance, like um, it's safer with the things I think I know. Yes. I don't even want to know about the things I don't know. <laughs> yes. Because then I'll be made to feel stupid and yep. I don't want to test because then I could make a mistake. And then you feel... <laughs> and then, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and I realised that desire was the key. So my question, Mary, is about um, did you find that the two process your injuries, if you had an ear round feeling stupid and making mistakes before you could do this or just step into the desire? Well, I think the desire, I built the desire, Joy. So I built, I read about God, I thought about God a lot more, you know, and the, I still had those fears of being humiliated, especially of making a big mistake and being humiliated. But the desire led me through that. You know the example I gave earlier to Elvira of when I was leading the mediumship team? I had a strong, solid desire to stay loving. I didn't want to waver from that point. And because of that, whoa, my fear got triggered and I came out the other end of it. And I maintained the, because I desired to be loving so much, I was willing to be humble in the process. And I feel it's the same in this journey. If, if I grow my desire, if my desire is strong enough, then I'll, I'll be willing to feel like, oh, I made a mistake, that feels yucky in the process. I don't, do you, would you add to that? No, I also feel though that Mary had to release some of her emotions in order to do that. You see, our, we have a lot of emotional hooks into both of these two areas. And yes, one of the best things you can do is start addressing some of those emotional hooks that you have in them. So, so for example, just how, how often do you say to another person, like, I've got no idea? I never used to say that at all. Exactly. So there's an emotional resistance to, to, to you admitting that you've got no idea. Now, obviously, if you've got an emotional resistance to admitting it, then it's going to be very, very hard to actually examine everything that's in that pile, that all of which you have no idea about. Who has an emotional uh, um, hook into uh, feeling, feeling wrong or making a mistake? But most of us, don't we? Like how, it's very rare for a person under today's environment to not have a feeling of a, a fear of mistake, of a mistake. Like quite often, early days, Mary would say, uh, I would say, I would like to go and do this. And Mary would say, but we haven't got the funds to do that. Or, we, you know, and I, I'd say, well, that doesn't matter. Like, why is that a limitation? Um, and it's only a limitation because of our fear. If we make a mistake and we've spent $1,000 making that mistake, we're not going to get that $1,000 back and then we'll be $1,000 poorer and, and, and we'll have made a mistake with $1,000 as well. So we'd rather not do it. And I'd say to Mary quite frequently, I'm a, I've made a lot of very expensive soul-based mistakes. And Dale like, says there's no price on your soul. There's no price on my soul, right? <laughs> if you've learnt through the process, it wasn't wasted. Yeah. yeah. So if it costs you, like, let's say you decide to move to another country and then three months later you decide, oh, I've got to move back. Like, I don't view that as a mistake. Now, you might have spent $50,000 or $100,000 doing that move and I still wouldn't view it as a mistake. Does that make sense? And if you have a, an investigative process going on, nothing's ever a mistake, really, like, in the process. I guess if you think, like, how much money have you guys spent on spiritual growth development, you know, <laughs> over the years? You know, all the courses you did and all the religions you've donated to and all, the, all of that. If you added all that up, how much would that be? It'd be a fair significant. For some of you, it's probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, over the years, yeah. all adds up. Huh? But if at the end of it you get one thing in this pile, was it worth it? Of course it's worth it. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so well, <laughs> well it, it was still worth it because now you know what's in these piles. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, so in other words, we, we often in that process discover what is not true for certain. So, 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 you know, like I go along to some kind of a religious format or, or new age thing and we start dealing with crystals and they start talking about law of attraction and, I, and they tell me, I've just got to think my way into positive th thoughts and when that happens, my life will change instantly and I'll be, you know, that's my law of attraction. And I'm there thinking, 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 <laughs> thinking, thinking. Testing, testing, thinking, testing, thinking, testing, you know, testing. Thinking, five years later... 
there's still not much difference in my life and I go, mm, maybe that doesn't work. <laughs> right? So that's something that I can put in the shore I'm as sure I'm sure that doesn't <laughs> work. You know, you're still getting some kind of answer, right? And, and, and that's really important because if you, if you don't eliminate what doesn't work, a lot of times you'll never discover what does. So. And maybe that's the true answer to your question, Joy. No, maybe my, I was a bit glib in the desire thing because really what I grew in two years before this really kicked in for me was humility, was the ability to go, oh, you know, like I might be stuffing up or, uh, you, you know, I'm more willing to see what's really inside of me. And yeah. that helped me step into this process more. Yeah. Like I, growing the humility enough to go, if I make a mistake, I'll put up my hand, you know. That really wasn't there yeah. for years ago. I think that's what the first two years has been about. I, I actually, uh, before um, I came to Earth this time, I've always enjoyed making mistakes. Um, this time I found it quite difficult because the projection of the world on you when you make a mistake is quite severe. Like in, in the last six years of my own progression, I've probably, like I probably could name all my mistakes on one or two hands that I've made. But... It's constantly getting flown at me and flung at me. And, and not only that, like come up with the media stuff coming soon, you'll find that that'll be their focus of attention, all of the mistakes that I've made. And, and if you worry about what other people view as your mistakes, you won't progress, honestly. But, but in the world we live in, there is such a hatred for mistake. Like the, the, it's like people hate it like because they have so much internal fear about making mistakes. So, so, for example, many people go, it would be a mistake to go along to one of those AJ lectures. Uh, I've heard people say that to their friends, right? that it would be a mistake to go along. And, um, and I'm thinking, well, how could it be a mistake? Like a mistake is only something that, you know, well, I don't even think there is such a thing as a mistake, really, to be frank. But... Uh, but a mistake would be to do one thing and then it not work and then to do exactly the same thing again and it not work and then the exact same thing again and to do that 15, 20 times and it still not work and then, then the big mistake would be to do it again. <laughs> you know, that to me is the mistake. It's never a mistake to try something new that has some form of logic or something associated with it for certain. Why would that be a mistake? And everyone goes, you can't trust. You know, it's all about trust. If it's perfect, then we can trust it. And I now feel that if someone came up and just said, you know what, I've made seven mistakes, and it demonstrates the humility of the person. Since breakfast, I've stuffed up in seven different ways. Well, I, I go, OK, well, now I'm dealing with an honest person. That's, I, I can yeah. trust honesty a lot more than someone who presents this facade of, like, oh, I've been a perfect mother, I've been a perfect daughter, I've been a perfect housewife. Or, uh, I go, well... My law of attraction is going very... AWOL, but, yeah. you know, everything that happens in my life is pretty bad, but I'm still perfect. <laughs> Right. So we view mistakes as untrustworthy, whereas I feel a humble person owns their mistakes and I feel more trustful. Yeah. So, uh, so I feel actually that one of the things that Mary did with, with your question is that she allowed... She, before then she was quite rigid about mistakes, weren't you, babe? Like, and um, fear of humiliation. Fear of humiliation like from mistakes. Saying, you know, she could feel it in the first DVDs. I was yeah. terrified. Yeah. And then um, a fear of other people knowing your true state, even, was something that Mary had to get That's over as well. Not you know? lovable. That was yeah. my feeling. And I had to get over that too. Like, you know, when I first uh, remembered all the details that have been teaching you over the last three years, one of the feelings I went through was this terrible feeling that I had was, oh, no, like, I've just got my life together and I've just got everything quite happy. And now I'm going to say that I'm Jesus to people. Now, how much is that going to stuff up my life? Right? And I had huge fear associated with that. And a huge fear of everyone would just focus on my mistakes. And, and so um, for a period of time, I decided that it was better for me not to say anything at all. And I went through three months. Of, it's a bit hard for me to not say anything at all, as you realise. Um, so I went through three months of that, and uh, um, and that didn't work very well. You know, I felt quite 
bad about myself in that place. And then I went through the place, all right, I will talk about the truth, but when anybody asked me how I know, then I wouldn't say anything about that. Right? So then I tried that. And, and so what happened is that uh, I was so, uh, just so afraid to just be me and, and be perceived as a person who's made mistakes that I actually wanted to be perfect before I spoke the truth. Uh, many of you actually have this going on too, right? You want to be perfect before you actually speak the truth. But the problem was, if, if, I, if I did that, I would never have met... I still wouldn't have met Mary even now. Uh, you know, we met three years ago. I would never even have met her. And for me, that w that's horrible. Like, not only would I have not met my soulmate, but my whole soul progression wouldn't have begun. I, I would still be that angry, fearful, demanding, controlling girl. I was three years ago. So. I only met Mary by embracing my desire to speak the truth, but also by speaking the truth about who I was. And you had to be humble. Her own family had me in their living room because I was saying that I was Jesus, ironically. And, and if I had never said that, they wouldn't have even had me in their living room. That's the irony. Right? And this is what happens for most of us, is that we're so afraid of making a mistake, we want to pre present everything perfectly, we don't want to embrace this process of desire, not understanding that the next set of enjoyable things in our lives can't happen without firstly embracing this set of enjoyable things and growing from that experience. And this is what this viewpoint of truth is all about. This is about, this is a, a growing experience it's not something where somebody just tells you the truth, like AJ gets up here and tells you what he thinks the truth is, all right? and everybody goes, no worries. We all believe that, as if that happens, right? And, and, throw, and throws away their life in the process. That's not what happens. Like for the majority of us, we have to go through the... And to be frank, I feel all of us have to go through this, ex this experimental process on our own desire. Nobody else can make you do it. Nobody else can force you into it. Nobody can manipulate you into doing it even. It's something that you need to embrace for yourself if you want to continue growing in the universe that God's created for us to grow in. And to me, that's really beautiful and teaches me a lot.